Okay, so thank you, Carol. And many people have set me up by hinting that culture has a role in violence and nonviolence. And what I want to do in these few minutes is to take the issue head on. So in 1985, when I first went to work with the Enga of New Guinea, the local people recommended that I work in a bucolic clan in the Ambum Valley, Valley, very peaceful. The clans hadn't fought for 25 years. They went to school together. They went to church together. They socialized. They intermarried. And um, I thought, this is a really good starter clan. And it really was a jump starter clan. Because after I'd worked there for eight months, um, there was a tussle in the valley bottom. One person was very severely injured from the clan I was working. The clan held their meeting, their men's meeting. Each person expressed his opinion, and they decided to go to war. And the process, I was able to be in a part of the process, not in the meetings, but later. Um, the process was that they first dehumanized the enemy and turned into enemy people they had married and gone to church with and gone to school with. And they sang all kinds of taunting songs like, your girls are not like ours. Their skins are like crocodile skins. They have pandanus thorns embedded in their vaginas. And their hair is as red as the clay of Nomala. Our boys are afraid to touch the skins of your sisters and daughters. You can go pay bride wealth to your own girls and marry all of them, implying incest. So these sessions went on taunting until they had established the two sides and brotherhood within the two sides. And um, after that, they went to war. And in the first days of the war, it was great, because they were fighting with bow and arrow, not guns then. So you could take your sandwich and go sit on the hillside and go to a war. <laughs> and um, it was like a football game, exactly the cadence of the beginning, or a soccer game, you know, of everybody cheering. And then as soon as someone killed, the anger set in, and the whole sound of the war was completely different. Um, then they fought for about a few months. Three people were killed, and the area was completely devastated, as you can see. And they realized this is futile, and they started peace proceedings, and they gave compensation, and they shared food. And by sharing food, they made each other human again. So um, all humans have this potential for aggression and reconciliation. And it's really cultural institutions. And by that, I only mean norms, beliefs, rules, and practices that generate some regularity of behavior. This is necessary for cooperation to have some understanding, regularity of behavior. And they modify aggression in all societies. What they really do is they structure cognition, how people see the situation, how people mentally represent their experiences, and in turn, release certain emotional responses. These cultural institutions are constantly updated um, to new circumstances. So in this case, cultural institutions bonded fighters and dehumanized the enemy. And they also provided a framework of exchange to make peace possible. Because as the saying goes, justice must not only be done, but be seen to be done. I must say, a lot of the justice that happens in Papua New Guinea, I don't see it as justice done. But anyway, cultural difference. So the, I think the central question we should be asking is not, are humans aggressive? But how are aggression and affiliation harnessed by cultural means to the benefit and detriment of human societies? Um, and what did differential success in harnessing aggression mean for our political evolution. We know that cultural control of aggression can make or break a society. Some societies get caught in the war trap, and they just go downhill. So here are some ideas of what vi um, coalitional violence can achieve. It can um, build male alliances vis-a-vis -vis an external enemy. It can establish a balance of power for intergroup exchange. It can build reputations for individuals who are fight leaders or peace leaders. It can forge intergroup alliances against someone else. So the political potential is great if it's handled in certain ways. So um, I, I left out a word here. How do groups handle aggression? So I'm going to compare the two societies I've worked with for over 30 years. One are the Enga of Papua New Guinea. 
and they harness coalitionary violence for economic goals. And then the Kung Bushmen, hunter-gatherers of Botswana and Namibia, and they really reject violence and they disperse in the face of conflict to avoid violence. So let's compare them. So um, the Kong uh, territories lack sufficient water um, for survival in many years. From here up to the top of the map is about 400 kilometers. And these lines here show the exchange partners of one person and all the places they can go in times of hardship. There are only about five reliable water points in this area. People are forced to move all the time to distribute themselves over resources, and they have to maintain networks and social ties to do this. And this is a picture of a lady wearing her beads, and these are gifts from all her partners, and she's flaunting her social ties because she's trying to marry off her grandson. <laughs> and so the Kong create um, networks of mutual access to alternate residences, and by that way, they maintain a high mobility, but they have few cultural means to deal with aggression. They have no club fights like the Eche. Um, they avoid aggression, and when it does break out, people do fight. They get the fellow by the arms, and they literally put him in a straitjacket so the body's wanting to fight, but the limbs can't move. And then after that, they disperse by voting with their feet and go live apart till things cool. But sometimes this happens too quickly, and arrows fly, people die, including the bystanders. Um, so the reasons for the conflicts, not surprising, is women, psychopaths, and, and in such societies where there's little violence, they, they hesitate to, to take out psychopaths until it's too late. Hate, revenge, resources very few, and unknown causes, I don't know the causes of all fights, so I'm going to just tell you some so a few stories of homicide that this old man Kling uh, told me to give you an idea of what it's like. So first of all is a chaotic response to violence. This, this man Klaus stabbed his lovely wife Shuko with a poison arrow out of jealousy. And the story goes, in the morning before sunrise, she cried, ooh, ee, I'm dying. Klaus, the boastful one, has killed me. Klaus returns to the scene and he provokes him. Have you perhaps seen Clow the Boastful One? Well, here I am, he said to his wife. And what did I tell you yesterday about not going to another man's fire? And now you are saying, ooh, and dying. In a rage, her brothers pursue him. You will die with your foreskin pulled back. You all, we will catch Clow the boy, Boastful One so he can shit on himself. They jumped up and chased him. Go die, ejaculate on themselves. And then there comes this long story for 10 minutes about dodging and chasing and chaos. And in the end, Cloud takes off. He lives elsewhere. And the story ends. Nobody killed him. He eventually died by himself. So you can see there's very little control, cultural controls of aggression here. Another story is of Sam Cloud, who was a notorious killer. And he killed a revered elder. This is a psychopath, clearly. And a couple men go after him. They shoot him. And he has nowhere to go, so he comes home to the people who shot him. And the story goes, wounded, Sam Kao really cried. He cried because he was miserable. His uncle, who was supposed to feel sorry for him, just spoke angrily. Sam Kao, his uncle said, and Sam Kao said, uncle, do not talk like that. And his granny, his granny, old Nuka, said, why are you crying? Just sit down and die, for you're too crazy to live. He refuted, poison will not kill me. OK. And then the next one is after his death, these people had to go back to the place where his mother lived to get water. Did you kill him, the people asked? Yes, we killed him. If you killed him, it's all right. He was killing all of you. Yes, he was killing all of us. He was such a strange thing. This is repeated for about five minutes, showing the guilt people feel of killing a kinsman. And his mother was there and said, even if he's dead, it doesn't matter. He was not normal. We're not going to blame each other. We do not even have to say that the one who used to be alive is now dead. Instead, we're going to live on. And so the story goes on. So you can see there's a strong cultural tendency to repress revenge, because if you had revenge, people could not move around with resources. But unfortunately, because there are no means to do with violence, no cultural means, the, the homicide rates are high. 
111 homicides per person per year. In the US in the 1990s, it was 9.8. Pinker's fi figures for tribal societies are 800 per 100,000, and the Semai, who are the most peaceful people, 30 out of 100. So they're high just because there's no way to manage them. Who's killed? Close family, close in-laws, others in camp nearby, very few in other groups. Revenge, it's often taken immediately in the same fight, but if not, only in a few cases, mostly of psychopaths, is it delayed, and there are a number of cases where it's, I, they know of no revenge. There's no evidence of war. So the outcomes is a wonderfully peaceful daily life with very little aggression. And when I lived at the community of Klekai in 74, about 150 people lived there. There were no physical injuries from violence, not one. Many heated arguments, seven um, physical fights in which people were straitjacketed. Mobility was maintained. The downside of this is there are no male alliances, corporate groups, and they're losing their land to ethnic, other ethnic groups. Now I'll move on to the anger of Papua New Guinea. Um, the two places could not be more different. Highland horticulturalist organized into clans and tribes, strong corporate group alliances, um, highly competitive wealth exchanges, which are fueled by wealth from outside. So they have both a corporate group strategy and like the Bushmen, a network strategy made on the basis of female ties. And war is used to bond corporate groups and establish balance of power so that the wealth can flow. They have many institutions to bond corporate groups. You can see at the bottom of the picture, men at a very early age go live in the men's house where they learn clan history, where all the men circulate from the clan, they bond. Then on the right side, they have bachelor's cults, which bonds a cohort. They have clan meetings where every man gives his opinion about the war. Will it hurt me? Do I want war? And the clan members support each other from cradle to grave, agriculture, house building, bride wealth, defense, funerals, all of these things. On the other hand, you have cultural institution to support the networks with other groups and many exchanges to celebrate mother's kin and in-laws. Warfare is for men only because if you kill women, that kills the networks because they're made on the basis of marriage ties. There are rules that contain warfare so they don't get furious, and there's peacemaking after all wars. And um, so when a man was, th these are some of the feelings that are generated of brotherhood by these institutions. When a man was killed, the killers, the clan of the killers sang songs of bravery and victory. Their land would be like a high mountain, and that's how it was down through the generation. <coughs> The member of the deceased clan would become small. They would be nothing. But when they had avenged the deaths of their brothers, their heart would be open because they had gotten back on an, evil, on an equal footing. So that explains these, these institutions generate a need for revenge. And another thing the brotherhood generated, people fight also for brotherhood. Fighting is like eating pork, sweet. If you don't want to fight, never start because after one war, Fighting will get in your blood. You will not want to stop the excitement, the brotherhood, the desire for revenge for the death of your brothers. So these are the feelings generated by cultural institutions that so contrast with the Bushmen um, who don't have these institutions. And the last one is they have peace exchanges and reconciliation. And um, here's a quote from a man. All things happen because of the tongue, the uncontrollable tongue that ought not to have said certain things. One must say soothing words to the victim's clan. After you had comforted the victim's clan with words, you must give them food at any opportunity. So this is formal institutions, again, with formal speech to um, change emotions. So the anger homicide right, um, rates, and these guys are pretty high up in the War Department. They fought a lot in the past. The warfare is 183 per 100,000 per year. The Kung was 122. Intra-clan homicide, 69. This is mostly brothers fighting over family land. Inter-clan homicide, 
115, there's a lot of pig theft, and that's what it's about. And the total is 367, which is way below um, Kim's figure for the Hiwi and Eche. Why? Because they have peacemaking and because they maintain a corporate and network strategy. So the outcomes um, there, frequent violence in daily life. I mean, Bushman life is wonderful without violence. In this community where I worked for the six months before war, there were 86 incidents of violence with non-lethal physical injury, like people's earlobes being bitten, someone chopped with a bush knife. Um, the upside was the war and peacemaking. They promote balances of power. And in the last 200 years, you had, before contact with Europeans, you had the rise of these vast pig exchange systems involving over 40,000 people. This political organization has developed strong leadership, which you can see in the Engen's influence in the modern national politics. So they have used aggression partly for their benefit. Um, and then I just wanted to end with the fact that cultural institutions change with context. People are pushing the envelope of the rules all the time. So the Kung homicide rates in Nai Nai have now gone down recently to 29 per 100,000 and Anga 51 per 100,000. People always say this is the state. In fact, most of this is not the state. The state doesn't care about these people. These are the people themselves changing their indigenous institutions, mingling them with state institutions to come into the modern world. So finally, the question is, what's culture got to do with it? My answer would be a great deal. Culture structures cognition, emotion, and responses. It's essential for understanding the past, the present, and building a less violent future. Thank you. Thank you.